Okay. Did you get my poems? Yes. Good evening, viewers. Good evening, viewers. Greetings, Sri Lanka. Ayu Boan. Asian Literary Society presents before you the Asian Connect. This forum invites the writers and poets whose writings are not only words of wisdom, but also leave an indelible impression and brilliance on Asian literature. We welcome on the forum Saitya Ratnavardi, Kamala Shri, Swastika, Kumari Hami, Disanayake, also known as Kamala Vijayaratne. Welcome, ma'am. Are you Boan? I Boan. I Boan. <laughs> Friends, may you may you live long. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends, Kamala Vijayaratne, born in Ulapane, a village 15 miles away from Kandy. She graduated from the University of Ceylon, Penadenia, in English, Sinhalis, and Economics. She acquired a postgraduate diploma in teaching English as a second language at the University of Penadenia and her first Master of Arts in Education at the same university. She did a second Master of Arts in teaching English to speakers of other languages at the University of Edinburgh. Author Kamala Vijayaratne spent 20 years teaching in the secondary level, 15 years in the tertiary level as lecturer of English at the English Teachers Training College, Peradenia and over 10 years at an administrative academic level as chief project officer at the National Institute of Education, Maharagama. She believes that these postgraduate studies not only honed her skills as a teacher and lecturer of English, but also they helped her in her creative expression. Rooted strongly in the Singhala village, author Kamala Vijayaratne responded with sensitivity to what she has passed through in her country, the growing violence and the widening disharmony between the ethnic groups, loss of life, loss of property, loss of opportunity, loss of expectations of the rural folk, etc. At a very young age, author Vijay Ratne had made it her life's mission to give voice to the voiceless by creatively penning the injustice she sees in the world through poetry and stories, many of which are self-published. She started writing in her teens while yet at school. However, serious writing started only in 1983 with the publication of an anthology of poems entitled Smell of Aralia Flowers. And thereafter, she published several collection of poetry books, A House Divided, The Disinherited, That Only Tenelt, Talent, the White Sari, and other poems, and many others. In Millennium Poems, she was a joint winner of the State Literary Award for the Best Collection of Poems. In the poetry book Impressions, she received the Godage Award for the Best English Poetry at the Godage Literature Awards. She was also honored by the Central Province Writers Association by including her work in annotated bibliography prepared by the association. Besides this, author Vijay Ratne brought several collections of short stories. In the book, 10 stories, and in the potted plant, she received the Godage Award for the best collection of short stories and the State Literary Award for the best anthology of short stories. Her first novel, An Untold Story, won the Godage Award for the best collection of short stories in 2019. A teacher of English literature to teachers and adult students, Tamala Vijayaratne knows the theory behind the short story. In fact, she had conducted a workshop on teaching the short story at the 9th Oxford Conference on Teaching Literature, Oxford University, UK, in the year 1990. Author Kamala Vijayaratne represented several national and international seminars and conferences. Her research publication in 2019. Cultural Language and Literature, a compilation of some research papers which were presented and published at national and international conferences, 
was widely appreciated by academic community. Her contribution to the field of English has been comprehensive and deserves recognition. On 2019, the title of Saitya Ratna was conferred upon Tamala Vijay Ratne by the State Literary Advisory Board of the Department of Cultural Affairs. She contributed to the Sri Lankan society and lives the life of a true patriot, a lifelong teacher. Welcome, welcome once again, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, ma'am, my first question to you is, you are a recipient of the Godaj Award for the best collection of short stories and the State Literary Award for the best anthology of short stories. Your collection of 10 short stories featured complex cultural topics of Sri Lanka. Would you like to give us an idea about the Sri Lanka's culture and how you weaved the intricate facts in your creative pieces? Thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, Sri Lanka is about 1 60th the size of India, I think. But still, uh, it's a mosaic. Uh, it, it features mm, at least three languages. Uh, three or four ethnic groups, three the three major religions or four major religions. So it's a it's a, a, a cross cultural patterning that we have in Sri Lanka. Uh, but my short stories are mostly about the majority community, uh, the single Buddhist, uh, the the problems they face. Uh, I would like to say it's actually a little more regional, like you come from Assam. Now, we don't, since Sri Lanka is smaller, we don't have states as such, but we have provinces. And then I come from the Central Hills, uh, which is, uh, uh, which was uh, regionally, uh, I mean, isolated, I would say, for a long time because the the Europeans overran Sri Lanka in uh, the 16th century. But uh, my area remained independent until about, well, for about three centuries later. So in the Central Hills, uh, you have what you can describe as indigenous culture, more of the indigenous culture. And uh, I, I, in my 10 stories, I try to track down the changes that are affecting this particular area, you know, the the westernization, the modernization, the some there are still vestiges of feudalism in the in the rural areas. You see, they are still rural. I think uh, not only rural, feudal in their way of thinking, like because in the first short story in the in the ten stories, the engagement. Um, you would have been familiar with uh, the problems that I trace. They are uh, a woman uh, brought up in the, uh, you might say, the feudal hierarchy, and uh, you know, marriage becomes a problem because they believe that a woman must marry within her caste, within a uh, within a social group, and then increasingly it, it's becoming difficult and things have become more complicated with uh, English education. So whereas earlier, uh, this particular rural hierarchy, they believed in, uh, you know, like the, they say the five fingers, you know, the, a woman has to, you know, look for a man with the five fingers. The five fingers was race, religion, caste, status, and, uh, you know, uh, money, but now it's more complicated because of English education. They look for a husband with all those and also an English education uh -huh. and a government job. So uh, this is a problem of uh, the aunt they are in the engagement. And finally, when they do find a man who seemed to be acceptable, then the caste problem encroaches. And so uh, she has to remain unmarried. I mean, I capture a, a real situation 
in in our region, in our area. You know, that's why I said the vestiges of feudalism are still there in certain pockets. Mm. Uh, and then also uh, in the in a long story, I try to see the, the changes that are taking place, like uh, especially with the urbanization and uh, the gradual westernization, how, uh, you know, how particularly these families, uh, they are so confused and especially the women suffer as a result because they are drawn between, uh, you know, the values nurtured by feudal culture, you know, like uh, loyalty to the group, loyalty to the parents, uh, you know, values of, uh, values of uh, uh, justice, if you like, you know, chastity, values of chastity and all that. But at the same time, they are challenged by the changes. Then there are other issues like, you know, uh, children like a girl uh, falling in love is still not accepted in certain places. You know, a girl is expected to wait until the parents decide her future. And so young students falling in love uh, may face problems with their parents. So there are these eternal uh, tensions between the parents and when you say the parents, the extended family, because there's uh, uh, still the extended family is very much uh, active in Sri Lanka. You know, of course, in the towns, uh, you know, children have more freedom, but in the villages, uh, you have to not only contend with your parents. Sometimes the parents are understanding, sympathetic, but then the extended family, uh, they will think in terms of uh, terms of status uh, and also uh, a, a reputation for the family. And uh, if a girl goes astray, uh, she has to face a uh, lot of complications with the extended family and uh, maybe with the rural society. The community still has something to say about it. Uh, so these are some of the issues that I deal with in 10 stories, especially this, uh, uh, this uh, hybridized situation, you know, like oh, where, yeah. uh, you know, hybridized, I mean, where, uh, you know, people are caught between the, the gradually cosmopolitan society, because become society is becoming cosmopolitan, uh, you know, westernized, English educated, but at the same time, there's the other side the feudal, uh, the values and the, the, the community's uh, role in bringing up children. So uh, young children find it extremely confusing with this kind of situation. That's what I try to capture in, um, in uh, 10 stories. And in the country cousin, you know, like where the young girl is sent to be socialized to a, a rich relation who is English educated and westernized. And then she's actually harassed by her cousins because uh, she's treated as, uh, she treated as uh, not important and uh, not educated or not cultured to uh, be accepted by the cousins, you know? So those issues, I'm sure you have them in India as well, you know, because, uh, these uh, these confrontations between the uh, between the westernized elite and the feudal cousins, you know, they seem to go on, and uh, I try to capture those. As I said, particularly the changes that are taking place and the resistance to change, then the effect on the individuals, particularly the women, the young girls, and uh, and uh, you know how they are trying how they try to sort it out sometimes they can't sort them out they are caught and then they are like in engagement the aunt is condemned to a life of uh, spinsterhood and uh, she tries to reconcile herself by bringing up her sister's children you know the sister children the nephews and the nieces seem to love her and then 
she seems to somehow they manage to accept her, her situation. Uh, I mean, I I suppose the Asian woman is like that. She's very con <laughs> very conciliatory, you know. Uh, she didn't fight these situations, you know. And I think in Sri Lanka, the Buddhistic attitude, you know, Buddhism teaches you upeksha, and that is equanimity. Uh, you, if you can't face the situation, uh, you know, uh, then you are condemned to grief and sorrow all your life. So what they do is they try to accept the situation and somehow they face face it. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a detailed, yes. a detailed uh, yes. discussion. Wonderful. Very enlightening. Yes. Um, you. Your poetry mostly dealt with your reaction against violence and unrest, especially of the North and the South. Uh, then disunity among the ethnic people of your country and social upheavals. So, ma'am, how do you voice these reactions in your verses? We had so much violence. After the first 10 years of independence, I think we were OK. Uh, things went on very smoothly. Uh, there was the ruling class left behind by the British. And they kept the status quo going. They didn't try to change anything. But in 1956, there was an attempt to change, uh, to, uh, to, to change the social uh, structure, in fact, uh, to, give, uh, to give prominence to the local language, singular. And then only thing is they made a lot of mistakes with, because they disregarded Tamil at that time. I think what we should have done is we should have given uh, prominence to both Sinhala and Tamil at that time. So that was the first uh, mark of violence, you know, violent, violence erupted because Tamil was disregarded and Sinhala was given the prominent place. Of course, they tried to redress it, but it didn't happen properly. Then in the 70s, there was the youth uprising in 71. And uh, the, apparently the youth uh, rose against the social structure. Most of them came from the rural, came from rural backgrounds, from uh, depressed class, depressed caste, in fact. And they wanted equality. They wanted recognition in the newly independent country. Uh, so 1971 was a terrible time. And then again, uh, in 1988-89, the same movement surfaced, uh, the youth demanding a place in the sun because they felt that the it was still the English-educated, westernized, anglicized middle class which was enjoying the plums of office in Sri Lanka. They were the ones who benefited. Uh, they were the privileged people and then they wanted to uh, displace that and then uh, come up and be recognized. But again, it was put down, violently put down, like in 1971, 1988-89, the movement was violently put down and 65,000 youth paid their price. Then in the North, in the North, another movement like that, similar to that, started. Because in the North, especially because uh, uh, the the place that was not given to Tamil lighting, you know, they they should have been accommodated from the very beginning. So there were a lot of grievances. You know, the Tamil youth couldn't get employment, and uh, like in the youth in the south, they felt displaced, they felt marginalized, and so they wanted a place in the sun. So uh, you know, in that way, although there was no uh, Combine, it was not a combined movement. You know, the Tamil youth fought separately, that single youth fought separately. But they were all demanding equality. They were demanding uh, the, a place, a, a, a recognition in the social structure. 
So I tried to capture the violence of 1971. Uh, I, I wrote... Uh, uh, I, my collection of poetry entitled "House Divided," yeah. and also, uh, and also that one talent, and then the white sari. They all yeah. deal with the violence, you know, they, different kinds of violence: violence in the south, violence in the north, and also uh, the violence by the youth was reciprocated by the government with similar violence. You know, it was uh, the government was as violent as the youth. So uh, it was a very uh, horrifying situation. Yeah. And I tried to capture it, particularly in the white sari. Uh, yeah. I think, Would you, I think you recite want, that poem? The white right. sari, will you recite? Yeah, I will recite that. But I think you also wanted to recite some poems. OK, should I recite then white sari? Yes, please do that. I would like yeah. you to decide that. Yes. Okay. So this is a poem, White Sari. I fling the piss of cloth, crumpled and creased in folds, over the head of the bed, pressed it against my breast, and start folding it. First into two broad lengths, the edges slipping away many times, then into four, and at last into two. Then I place one half over the other, make it into a big white square, and put it back into the almira. But on second thoughts, I will hang it on the towel rack. I don't know when I'll need it again. Thrice in a week, I have had to take it out of the almira, smooth it against my breast. No time to press an iron on it and wear it. First it was Jagat, then Hiran, and today Ajit. I don't know who will be next. Jagat was killed at home, getting ready for dinner. Hiran was on his way to work, and Ajit shot building the dam. They were all so young, scarcely 30, and their years were well before them. I remember how I dreaded death as a little girl, how I put my fingers in my ears to keep out the terrible wailing. Mother never told us when someone died. She and father, dressed all in white, went away and came back with solemn faces. She did not enter the house without rubbing her half lime on her head and the palms of her hands. Father would go to the well to take a bath. Death was so unclean and unpropitious. But now I wear the same sari thrice a week and stare at the young faces so painfully accusing in death, accusing us, the old, of living on. Denying them that same life, cheating them and extending our own. I cover my eyes with the edge of my sari. My throat dries up and I feel choked. I avoid the eyes of the mother and say the expected words. I put my hands together and bow to the father. And I come away from the house of death. No, no, I will not put back the sari on its shelf in the Almira. I'll put it back on the towel rack. I can't say when I'll need it again. Thank you. It's, it's a beautiful poem. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, my third question. Uh, on the uh, International Research Conference on Humanities and Social Sciences, Colombo in 2016, you had a paper on ethnic folklore and shared wisdom. So how do you think folk literature can integrate and empower people of uh, diverse ethnic backgrounds? Uh, because uh, they, you can become aware of your commonality, your common roots. Because when I did this uh, research, when I did this invest investigation, I worked with uh, a student of mine, a Tamil uh, uh, scholar. Uh, she's teaching at Jaffna University now. So she helped me with the Tamil folk tales. Uh, you know, she translated the Tamil folk tales to me, and I translated the singular folk tales to her. In certain stories, we found the same plot, the characters the same, but of course the names are different. In the singular areas, they had different names. In the Tamil areas, they had Tamil names. 
But the story was the same. And then in certain others, you know, the, uh, the attitude was the same. You know, like the, uh, you know, uh, to, look, to look with sarcasm at authority, to laugh at authority, uh, and also to laugh at hypocrisy. You know, in all, most of these stories, uh, you know, the, the, the less privileged, they would laugh at the, at the privilege, at the, uh, the follies of the more privileged, you know. So there was this shared attitude. Uh, and also, I think, by, by sharing the commonalities, they could also see the differences. Because in the, uh, uh, in the Tamil folk, stole, folk tales, I found more of the presence of gods and spirits oh. and so on. Whereas in the singular folk tales, uh, there were the, the, the fools, you know, like a lot of fools and, you know, people laughing at fools and their, you know, follies and that kind of thing. So uh, I think you become aware of your, uh, you know, of the differences and maybe probably they relate to your own characteristics. Uh, maybe like in good teaching, you can bring out, uh, you know, uh, perhaps because a story, a, a story writer in a way, projects his background, his context onto the story. So probably they could develop more understanding, you know, while sharing the common features, you know, like as I said, uh, both uh, in, in both uh, types of stories, there was, a rever there was regard or respect for bravery, for courage, for integrity, for, uh, you know, uh, for goodness, they were shared, I think. Uh, but then there were differences, you know, when it came to folly and when it came to wickedness and that kind of thing, you know, there was this general condemnation. So I think that's a platform that yeah. we can use in the classroom for children to share and to see their common roots. You know, while we are different, uh, there, are, there is a common origin. And then we can work out on the common origin. And I think that could bring about understanding and perhaps wisdom, eventually wisdom, I think, insight, insight into each other's cultures. In fact, I, I suggested to a friend of mine, why don't we put out a collection, you know, where we have the Tamil short stories translated into sing English, the singular trans singular stories translated into English, and if possible, I didn't actually investigate Muslim folk tales. I'm sure there are. I said, then we can build up that mosaic, you know, like we are, we share all three groups of people, share their common characteristics, and maybe also try to understand their differences. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last question to you. On the ninth Oxford conference, on teaching literature in Oxford University, you have conducted a workshop on teaching the short stories. Would you like to give us few tips to the upcoming writers of Asian Literary Society? Thank you very much. Uh, um, you mentioned the word tip, so I think I will <laughs> use that. Uh, okay. Firstly, like, you know, short story, when you say, uh, I want to exploit that, you know, that particular concept the short story, the concept of the short story. So shortness, shortness does not mean the number of words or number of pages or number of lines or whatever. Shortness, brevity, uh, you know, means compression. You compress, you compress life into your story and try to say what you want to say in as little space as possible. Sometimes a short story uh, runs into maybe 50 to 60 pages. Uh, sometimes it's just half a page. But still, it's not, as I said, the, the number of pages that matter, but what you put into the sh short story, uh, the com compression like Hemingway's iceberg theory, like because what you see on top is very little, but you 
what you have, what you understand is the larger thing inside the sea, you know, inside the ocean. So you say little, but you mean more. So I think that is what you have to get, get at, you know. You say little in the most selected kinds, selected words. You are very choice, very choosy about your words, about the symbols you use, but then you mean uh, quite a lot. So the larger effect is created in the in the readers. They understand, you know, they they read meaning into it as a result of the compression you impose on the short story. Then the idea of a story, the idea of a story, a story has to capture the reader. So uh, the story, it has to um, it has to create an impression. It's only if you create that impression that story, that readers will uh, relate to you. They will somehow other, you know, like uh, be able to read meaning into it. So uh, the elements of a story, like for example, uh, uh, a very captive kind of plot, the characters perhaps who relate to you, who in, who interpret uh, what you want to say, because I'm sure a short story, in a short story, we'll want to say something about life, the reality of life. This is the difference between the short story and other short forms like the legend, the myth, the fairy tale and the uh, you know, they are also short stories, but uh, they don't uh, perhaps analyze life in the way that we want life to be analyzed today. I mean, we enjoy, of course, the enjoyment must be there as well, you know, because any story must be enjoyable. But besides enjoying it, it must create this lasting impression about life in general. So if you can do that, you write a story and into it you compress life, you compress a particular context, and you bring characters into it who convey, uh, you know, what you want to say through the short story, then you have got a good short story. So uh, I contributed a short story to uh, Glass, uh, to Glass Walls, edited by, uh, uh, you know, I forget her name now. So uh, two of two ladies in Australia. Uh, and I called it garbage, you know. And uh, what I wanted to do was the title garbage, you know, like this ethnic, it, it's about ethnic differences, the prejudices, you know, the prejudices of people, you know, like there's a, uh, you know, every, every morning there's a, there's a bag of garbage dropped in front of a particular gate. And this woman is highly prejudiced. She thinks it's the Tamils, it's the Muslims, it's the Christians who are doing all this. Finally, she realizes that it's none of those but the dogs who are doing it, you know. So I through that I try to get the idea of ethnic difference and then the futility of this kind of prejudice in people. So like that, you know, uh, so you have to get the right kind of background, right kind of context. Uh, select the characters and then of course through them you try to say something to the world to to society and in our societies i think this understanding among ethnic groups and also um, and also these divisions i think as writers i think we have to try and overcome those and our message i mean you don't call it a message but then people get it i think so you had to try and get it across what you want to say. It could be uh, like in the in the ten stories, uh, it was different. It was mostly empathy with the with that particular class. I think I mentioned this rural feudal, still rural rural feudal class who are caught up in this, you know, like uh, the changes that are taking place, you know fighting a cosmopolitan world. But in garbage, I, it was different. I thought my mission was to bring about, you know, uh, 
to actually expose, expose prejudice and then to laugh at it. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. So friends, uh, we need to use words judiciously, you know, to capture uh, the readers uh, so the readers can read meaning uh, into it. Thank you so much. Uh, Ma'am, thank, thank you. This is a wonderful session. And I would like to thank the viewers, uh, Sunil Algama, uh, Dimitri uh, Shifpriya, Mr. Manoj Krishnan, Ramendu Sharma, Anil Kumar Sivastav, Neha Gupta, Nisha Tandon, uh, Ankurita, okay? And uh, there are many more. Uh, I'm so grateful to the viewers. Uh, Anjali Srivastav, Sheila Ayer, uh, Vandana Bhasin, Hemant Galot, uh, Mahua Sen, Jeba, uh, and all of you. Thank you so much, viewers. Stay tuned uh, for another session with another uh, author for another Asian country. And thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, are you Bohan? <laughs> are you Bohan? <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. May you live long, you know, that's it. Yeah. May you live yeah. long. You know. Thank May you, you Sri Lankan. Thank you, viewers of Sri Lanka. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.